Yeah, the, uh, the letters, I think, are terrific, but they're not useful in describing combat. But they describe everything but combat. And, and, uh, but the basic training discussion or what he likes or doesn't like about the Army or uh, he takes a, when they're in South Hampton, he takes a weekend furlough in London or what wartime London's like. So he's just a good, he's a good, got a good narrative style. But boy, once you get into combat, A, you have wartime censorship, and B, I think, yeah, I think there's, there's soft censorship is sort of what Mike indicated before. You, your sergeant is going to tell you to say, you know, it, you're not helping anybody at all by saying how bad things are. You're not helping your mom, right? Your mom doesn't want to hear that, right? So you need to think about how you're communicating. So Carl's, he joins this rifle company Christmas Day, 1944. He said uh, within 30 days, he's in the top half of seniority of, of the company because of casualties. And the company, through the course of combat, through the final six months, had over 100% casualties, something like 150%, meaning uh, the soldiers are killed or, or, or taken out, and their replacements are killed, and their replacements are killed. So you just have extraordinary amount of carnage in this group, and just nothing but you know bad news until until you get toward the end, and it sort of the pace of combat slows down a bit. So so the letters become very sterile, um, where he can <coughs> talk about. So Mike said you talk about the snow or something. Um, and there's even there's even the letters where you assume he's really facing death. There was a there's a terrible moment at the at sort of the real low point of the Battle of Bulge, and you follow these letters, there's a, there's a note where he just says uh, to his mom and dad, words to the effect of, you know, I've just been reflecting how lucky we are as a family, and how great it is that we've had each other. And you say, wow, this is it. This is the final moment. This is not a letter that any normal teenager writes to his mom, I tell you that. So, so he's just trying to say, you know, I love you. Yeah, so, uh, so then, they, then they pick up again, and attitude is, you know, the situation improves. So. And the oral recordings? The oral well, there were a few, he participated in a few different oral history projects, and that was a component. And then I had what kind of started this whole process 13 years ago, was I realized, as my father passed away about three years ago, uh, I realized back then, it was because of the St Spielberg and the Tom Hanks, I realized, you know, my dad fought. My dad served, he fought. I, I have no idea what his unit was, I have no idea what his duty stations were, I don't know what his specialty was, I don't know nothing. So it started just as a 30, uh, about a 30, 40 page monograph for family use. Subsequently we found the letters, literally found these letters in the furnace room and you could transcribe them and interpose them with what he'd given as, as part of my interview with him. And then, and then go back and re-interview because a aided memory, as we all know, aided memory when he's looking at a letter that sparked addition. So it ended up with a reasonable uh, process. And then it's just detective work, then it's just going to various, the Library of Congress has a lot of material, there's a lot of collections of material there were about 20 published memoirs from soldiers in his division and about 10 unpublished pa papers or oral histories of people that I, that I found. So I've got 30 somewhat, uh, somewhat contemporaneous, somewhat similar memories that other people are talking about. And so there's a reasonable overlap at different incidents at different points. There's some divergences, but, it, but you can put it all together to come to a reasonable story and one whole company, he's, he's in Company L, the 335th, Company K actually wrote a book that's very well received in military history, of course called The Men of Company K, where they actually just talked through that they sort of wrote a collective history of their company. Company L didn't do that, but at least you have some sort of parallel activities that allows you to do some diagnosis about what's going on. So, thank you. Yes? You know, I can certainly relate to uh, that, uh, that feeling and those sentiments of not wanting your family to uh, realize that uh, the atmosphere was uh, dire. Uh, let's fast forward from 1949, 20 years, and while 20 years later, I was in the Vietnam mm. conflict, but 1969 or so, uh, while we also wrote letters, we also had the benefit of technology, mm. and we had these little tape recorders. And so I, I remember taping, and I still have that tape, uh, a tape to my parents saying, Mom, Dad, did I luck out? I'm sitting on a bridge. I have bridge duty. I'm not even out in the field. Little did I realize that on that tape, in the background, you could hear mortars uh, going <laughs> off. And, uh, and I didn't never realize it because I had become accustomed to that sound. But now I have that tape. And in the background, you do, in fact, hear uh, yeah. Well, I think, you know, when you think about it, I think this, this we call these uh, white lies, noble lies, you're not giving the full story, but you're doing it for the right reason. 
right? And you, you think, I think that's the right approach. Uh, I just happened to read, probably people have read this book that came out of this year, Hillbilly Elegy, where this fellow, it takes place in the present day or t 10 years ago, he signs up for the Marines, he shows up at Paris Island, he's literally given a, some kind of a three by five card, you're allowed to make a call to your mom, this is what to say. This is what you have to say, right? And they're watching and while you say it, it's like, you feel like you're North Korea or something. You say, hey, mom, I made it safe. You know, looks good, good talk to you, gotta go. But it's just sort of one sense to your mom, but at least, you know, at least you're alive. So, so that kind of structured communication, I think, is deep with military tradition. There's, a, there's an element, I'll, I'll get you, just to finish the story. Because you can't talk about combat, uh, my dad and his dad had previously worked out a code that when he's going to be sent into combat, he's supposed to say to his dad in a letter, I'm going to see Mr. Ginsburg. We're going to see Mr. Ginsburg tomorrow. And just, 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 a, just a name. Uh, so he does this. He, in, in, it's in the book, he says, you know, tomorrow I'll see Mr. Ginsburg. His dad writes back, takes, you know, it's V-mail, takes two weeks or whatever to get there. His dad gets his dad writes back. Who's Mr. Ginsburg? <laughs> And why, I thought, I thought you were fighting in a war. Why are you telling me about your, well, then he can't say no. So he has to say, listen, it's sort of a long story and I'll explain it to you when I see you, you know, saying, holy cow. So it's, it's very tough to communicate. You weren't allowed to keep diaries or notes for Phil, they might fall into enemy's hands. There's stories from the Battle of the Bulge when we have a lot of American POWs taken prisoner. That's where Kurt Vonnegut's taken prisoner. That's the only U.S. Army division that is destroyed in the war is the Battle of Bulge, not, not reconstituted. Uh, but, but American POWs, families back in the U.S. get letters with U.S. postmarks saying, we've got your son. So, they're, so the Nazi spy network, communication network is sophisticated enough that they can deduce or somehow understand where this person's family address is and signal to somebody in the U.S. to send a note saying, We've got your son. So, so yeah, so, so it's an enormous amount of wartime security about don't, don't write or keep <laughs> contemporaneous notes about where you are. Don't share anything about morale. All of this stuff could be captured. So, yes, sir. Who were the officers, uh, American or British, that were in charge of the Battle of the Bulge? Uh, well, Eisenhower takes command. Eisen, Eisenhower, is, everybody, real, it's interesting, if you look at... Uh, German planning, and this is, this is Hitler's initiative. And you have von Ronstadt saying 10% chance of success. But this is Hitler's you know, audacity, right? That Hitler's, in his planning, he says it will take one week uh, for the Allies to completely understand what they're facing, and it will take one week more for London and Washington in the field to sort of coordinate a response. So I've got two weeks running room. Uh, before I have to deal with their response. Eisenhower decides the same day, the first day of the attack, December 10th, this is what's going on, and he detaches two divisions from Patton and has them go against the Bulge. So the point is the U.S. response, the Allied response, is extremely fast, extremely good. You can certainly criticize the Allies for uh, not having the intelligence that allowed it to happen, but a very quick response. But for, but for several weeks, it's not clear. For several weeks, uh, Germany's on the offensive, and the Allies are on the offensive, on the defensive, sorry. After several weeks, you can bring in your manpower and sort of stabilize the front. So, uh, I don't know the headquarters. Who was, who were the well, then you have group commanders, Omar Bradley, uh, Field Marshal Montgomery, uh -huh, okay. group commanders. But again, you have, you have as I said, uh, 600,000 combat troops there. So it's sectoral, sectoral commands with different army corps. Mm -hmm. So, I, you look, I think, I think if you read, the, I ended up reading about 40 conventional histories, 40 published histories of the battle, you end up with the impression of saying, look, the, the, the response was managed well, but there was an extraordinary intelligence failure that allowed it to take place, and not to have supposed or planned for something like this was definitely so caught by surprise. It was a successful surprise attack, but the ability to respond to it was, was a very capable response to it. Sorry, sorry you had a question no, earlier. Well, you kind of answered my question about discouraging letter writing to specifically name areas you were in. So in case they were intercepted, right. the enemy couldn't do anything. Um, what was the balance of power between the Nazis and the Allied forces? 
which one seemed to have the overpowering numbers? For, for the first few weeks, the Nazis did. For the first few weeks. They had a few, the, the entire offense was only a few hundred thousand people. So, but, but they were smashing through lines that were thinly manned. So, but they had something like two to three hundred thousand people they brought to bear. We ended up with four hundred thousand. But, but again, it took several weeks to, to marshal that and to get them there. So, so they were able to maintain an offensive for several weeks. Look, it was kind of an ill-conceived plan, but as others have pointed out, uh, this, is, this is what Hitler did brilliantly in 1940 with the first offensive. He went right through the Ardennes and all of France collapsed. So it, it worked once. So, uh, so we, you know, you'd have that in your mind from the German side, we know what to do. So, uh, so it, and it, worked, it worked for a few weeks, but they just didn't have the, have the materiel and have the manpower to, to pursue it. So, so, yes, Gordy. I am embarrassed to tell you. <laughs> I am embarrassed to tell you. It took about 13 years. It took, and, and uh, I'm not a trained historian. I'd written one other book before. I enjoy writing, but, uh, but I think I'm more of a detective than a historian, meaning what I want to do is find all, everything I can find out about what happened. There's a lot, there's a lot of military documents, official government documents that are there. There's an enormous amount of published history there. There are these first paper memoirs. There are a lot of personal papers and oral history. So there's an enormous amount out of there. So it is just a lot of dream saving. And then, Gory, we made a decision. I made a decision very early on about aperture, meaning the world doesn't need a history of combat in Europe. The world doesn't need a history of the Battle of the Bulge. There, there are literally dozens of books where people have covered this ground very effectively. Uh, so let's, let's take them to a small unit. Let's just tell. Only say something if you're saying it with an original voice, original insight, don't, and, and we'll provide historical context, but we're not trying to provide a history of the Western Front. Um, and uh, so the book was more or less written, I should say, five or six years ago. Uh, then you're talking to publishers, you're talking to agents and publishers, Ohio University Press, the wo woman there was lovely, and she said, uh, look, I think you've got a book here potentially, but what you show me isn't a book, but we have this, we have this memoirs from World War I that we really like and we publish. Why don't you read this? And if you can make your book like this book, we'll publish it. And so then that's, that's for me, that's a several year journey. And you're right, I had to do this sort of on leave. You're back on leave from Singapore, so you can take a week off and you spend a week at the Library of Congress, or you spend a week here, a week there. And it just, you know, it's a little bit of a chore, but, but you get through it. So, but I'd encourage, I'd encourage people, if you have that orientation, I mean, you can do it. You can make that journey, so. Sure. You know, a lot, uh, I think in retrospect, uh, it all sort of made sense because this is, you've got this duality of people at the most serious thing an adult can do, which is serve in combat. Uh, so you've got people performing, I think, at very high levels of proficiency and civic awareness and patriotism, and they're doing their job. And at the same time, they're all teenagers. And as soon as you take them out of that mission mode, they become teenagers again. Uh, and so, and again, it isn't, and, and I think the surprise for me is realizing my dad, at some point, was a teenager. And uh, <laughs> there's one vignette where on the same uh, day, the squad, kind of like the one, the first vignette I where the squad has said, hey, we saw some movement on a tree line. You guys, four of you guys go up on patrol and see what's up there. And all four, you know, people go, they, they said, look, we're gonna get 50% casualties from this encounter. But this is, you know, Sergeant says, go, go, go up there and tell what's going on. And so everybody does and nobody complains. Nobody says, I did it last time. Nobody says, you know, my, my feet hurt. I mean, everybody just says, yeah, do it. And so they come back from that patrol, luckily no casualties. And it happens that a battalion medic shows up and the battalion medic's got his health records and he says, you know, some of you guys are behind on your shots. Every single person lies to the medic. Every single person says, no, you're wrong, different guy with the same name, it's not me, I had my measles shot already. So it's just this great teenage view that, when, look, when something's important, you've got to do your job. But when you have a chance to lie to an adult and get away with something, you ought to do that too. So I, I found that kind of encouraging in a way that uh, I said, you know, it's kind of what, what, why we like teenagers in certain times. So, uh, so that, was, that was just that human element of it was surprised me. Yes, please. Uh -huh. um, I know Mark has a lot of stories that relate to Judaism. Mm -hmm. How does this book in, in 
Judaism. Yeah, there's, look, he's very proud of his Jewish identity. It's, a, it's an ongoing theme in his discussions with his uh, uh, mom. Uh, he goes to High Holy Day. And you probably got several things going on there, too. In fairness, you've got, I, I mean, I think he does want to go to High Holy Day service, but it's also you get a half day off duty to say, we'll truck you someplace and you go to services. So he says, fine, sign me up. So there is, um, uh, so, so it's, it's, that theme is, is uh, throughout. Uh, there's also a very poignant, the, the first concentration camp the Americans liberate is Buchenwald, and it's the first week of April, 45. And Eisenhower visits it very shortly thereafter, so the second week of April. Eisenhower takes Patton and Bradley with him. Patton gets physically sick at this site. Patton, uh, Eisenhower does uh, two things, two directives out of that visit. He sends a note to Marshall, cable back to Marshall, who's chairman of the Joint Chiefs, his boss, saying, uh, you need to get all journalists you can and all congressmen you can to come look at this. You need to just send everybody you can through this site. That's one. Then he sends a directive to the troops under his command saying any Jewish GI may have on uh, leave to, you know, we're going to arrange trucks and we'll take you up and you can go through the concentration camp. Um, and uh, Carl says, look, he's summoned into his captain's office. There's something like four Jewish guys in the company at that point. And they said, you guys, hey, here's a note from Eisenhower. If you guys want to go, we'll get a truck for you. And the other three say, yeah. And Carl says, uh, no. He just said, look, I, at that time, we've, we've gone through, you know, four or five months of bad news, of just terrible things, people getting killed, friends getting killed, people getting wounded, people just, just terrible stuff. And the desire or ability to see more terrible stuff was just non-existent. So he said he just couldn't stomach it. He did say he subsequently regretted. He regretted saying no to that. But at the time, he just couldn't absorb it. So he was, he was, very, he was keenly aware of, uh, of this dimension. I'll, I'll share uh, something with you, too, because you, know, you are left with the question that you're suggesting, which is, look, is there any point or lesson to this? Is there anything we can salvage from this? Uh, well, the Army's got a program, uh, a library program of books for the GIs, which is not terribly useful in combat, but once they're into occupation, there's division libraries. And it's, you know, it's everything from popular literature from, from Edgar Rice Burroughs and Sherlock Holmes to, to, you know, Charles Dickens and Shakespeare. I mean, it's just a, it's a library for the troops, right? Um, and there's movie nights and so forth. So Carl's hungry for this question about, well, what is, was there any meaning in this? What happened with this? And he picks up uh, a book which was a huge bestseller then remains a, a very popular book now, but it's Will Durant's uh, History of Philosophy. So it's the hungry for what, what, how do the great philosophers speak to us and tell us to deal with uh, this kind of disruption. And he writes to his mom, he said, you know, of all the philosophy, I've read this book on philosophy, and uh, the one philosopher who, who spoke to me, who I think, really made sense was uh, Spinoza. He said, well, that's interesting. Uh, now we can go back into Durant's book and we can look at what Spinoza says. Here's Spinoza's quote, which I think, you know, you're looking at the wreckage of Nazi Germany. And he's talking about the state as a, as a nation. He said, the last end of the state is not to dominate men, nor to restrain them by fear. Rather, it is to free each man from fear, that he may live and act with full security and without injury to himself or his neighbor. The end of the state, I repeat, is not to make rational beings into brute beasts and machines. It is to enable their bodies and their minds to function safely. It is to lead men to live by and to exercise free reason, that they may not waste their strength in hatred, anger, guile, nor act unfairly toward one another. Thus, the need of the state is really liberty. So it took a very powerful sort of theological lesson out of that, I would say, not, not sort of precisely spiritual, but certainly grounded in Jewish teachings about what, what, what can we take away from this war so that it doesn't happen again. So, thank you. Yes? After the war, how, how did this all impact your dad when he returned home? Yeah, I, I, yeah it's interesting because... Uh, it's, it's, I can describe my dad to you, but that doesn't fully answer the question because you don't know what, 
what like, but he was an extraordinarily sedate man. He never had a chip on his shoulder. As, as my friends would always say, like, you've got the greatest dad because, you know, you burned down the barn and his only reaction was, well, did anybody get hurt? Well, be, don't do that again. So, I mean, it's a, he's just a very, very sedate guy, very John, non, non-judgmental guy. And uh, he said... He picked up his life and moved on. He picked up his life and moved on. He picked up his life and moved on. Yeah, I think that whole generation said, look, the way you prove Hitler wrong is by having a happy, successful life. Um, he said to me that when he got out of the army, his view was, but if he never had a lucky day ever again in his life, he would still die a lucky man because of that six months of luck. So he was always sort of very grateful that he got through it, that he survived, that he did his job, right? So and many people are haunted by, their whole lives are haunted by those experiences, whether they were Europeans or Americans. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, this is probably not the right time in the U.S. to say this maybe, but uh, because we believe in sort of sharing. I think that generation said, don't share. Just kind of, just kind of button it up and just get on with your life. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can do about it. Also, I can tell you what else, you know, the other important element of that generation's life, certainly my dad, was these were all kids of the Great Depression, too. So these were all kids who grew up with enormous limitations. Uh, the family was prosperous enough, so there wasn't, there wasn't deprivation, but they all, anybody had a sense of limitations and a sense that saying, look, these are enormous hardship the whole country's going through, so you are lucky to have food on the table, so, be, so, so there's a lot of gratitude for what you've got and, and expectations of life were very kind of baseline expectations. So, so uh, yeah, so he just picked up his life and went on. Yeah. Sorry, you had a question, please. I consider I consider basically a soft man. I consider a very loving guy who had again he had no chip on his shoulder. He would he was very non judgmental about things. Uh, you know, he was a very content guy with his life. Um, very loving father. Very I'm very lucky to have you see other people tell stories about their dads to say, gosh, I'm very lucky to have this dad. So uh, um, I'm not sure does that answer your question or that, was there something I'm missing? I'm not sure I got your question. Well, you said that he was a child that grew up in the Depression. Right. Uh, do you consider him uh, anyway a dispossessed person, like uh, a Damon Rust person, Damon Runyon person? No, he, uh, look, the family business, there's a little, there's a little background just for context. Like the family business is a, is, it's literally a family business. It's a butcher shop that expands from, uh, the 1890s to 1940 to be a, a larger meat processing employs about 200 people. So a family-run business, uh, small scale. Because of the Great Depression, uh, the, the, you know, the good news is there's no such thing as debt or corporate loan. So everything sort of grows organically over 40 or 50 years. But the reason I say that's good news is because then when business drops, you say it's okay. All we have to do is, you know, kind of uh, go along with the drop. So they, they, they change the business from five days a week to three days a week. They, don't, they say we, we're not firing anybody, but everybody's going on 60% pay, and that's it, and we're going to get through it. And so you can get through it because, well, there's no debt to service, so you say, look, I've got some bad news here, which is everybody's losing two days a week of work, but the good news is nobody's getting fired. So you, you'd say that's, that's where we are. And my grandfather was an extraordinary religious Cleveland Indians fan, I just want to throw that out there. But, 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 but he would take the train. It's like for 25 cents, you take the train from Canada to Cleveland. For 15 cents, you see the game. And he said, that's what we're doing. You, there's no business to do, so we're going to go see the game. So, so, I mean, but luckily, you know, that, that, that kind of financial situation, you'd say, look, it's, it's certainly a belt-tightening moment, but if you're out of that. If, if unemployment's at 25% and you read these stories of, you know, just dire poverty for some folks, I mean, really bad shape, you say, actually... That kind of situation isn't bad. You can get through. You can get through bad weather. You just you're not you're not going to have any disposable income if if somebody reduces your salary forty percent. I mean that's a tough moment. But but the good news is you are you are going to get through it. So uh, but I think that does shape your life and shape your worldview. Right, so. 
but okay. yes. Did your father join any of the organizations like the Jewish War Veterans? Did he keep up any connection? No, and his and this by the way ties into the previous question too. I think part of his concern about not talking about it was maybe that helps you get through it, but I know one of his concerns was also concern about glorifying war or triumphalism. So he was always sort of skeptical of uh, he had disdain for the war movies, disdain for the TV shows that were popular in the 1960s, uh, and, and, and always just a bit skeptical of those groups. His, uh, his dad, my grandfather, who was a World War I vet, shows me his 50-year American Legion membership card, and my dad said, look, I went to one or two of the meetings, and it's, it's not for me, and that, you know, whatever. I think it's what I just articulated. You just didn't, you just want, you want to leave it behind, right? So... But there's a, fun, by the way, you had a question earlier about Judaism. There's a funny note from my dad to his dad at some point in this mess where my grandfather apparently becomes vice president or vice chairman of the, of the small congregation in Canton, Ohio. He's elected, you know, because my dad says to him, hey, congratulations on being elected vice chairman. I guess now you'll have to attend services. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> so, good. Is that? Were you, were you in the military? Yeah, I served. In, I never served in combat. I served in the Navy <laughs> Reserves for about seventeen. Look, I enjoyed it. Uh, you learn a lot. You grow a lot. Uh, you're doing your bit, and uh, there's a whole, you know, there, there's a, there's a lot in the military to respect, and I think it's important to I tell anybody to at least have some. Even if it's not your career, that's fine, but have some literacy in that area when you're, you can just understand broader events. So I'd, I'd encourage people to do it. It does, you do grow, you do learn a lot. Aurelia was, where's Aurelia? Right here. Aurelia was M MP, Army MP? Intel. Intel. And, and other people here put up their hands, uh, people who served and so forth. So I, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd encourage people to do that. It does, you just, you just get your game up and it exposes you to a different way of thinking and doing. And then, you know, it, it my experience, a little bit like my dad's experience, you know, the first six months, you're sort of saying to yourself, none of this makes any sense. And then after about six months, you say, you know, actually, a lot of it does make sense. So, uh, so it just broadens you a bit. I encourage you to do it.